I have got a wizard on the show for you guys today. His name is Ajit Nawalka. So over the past 12 years, Ajit has founded or co-founded several companies that focus on human transformation, including Mind Valley, Evercoach, and the Dharma Coaching Institute. Today, we're going to be talking about self-coaching. Um, so he's done a lot of business coaching, he's done a lot of business, and he's done a lot of life coaching and work with people. And he's seen this tremendous need for people to understand the importance to of being able to coach yourself and how we can utilize coaches of course to create a stimulus for growth but then what right and we get into all sorts of things about like things that happen he shares stories of things that happened in his life that were like these moments that triggered this opportunity of like where am i going to take this and it's really inspiring and he has some really really great tips at the end i asked for like some nuggets and wow they were good so make sure you listen through for those um we'll, we'll link up all of these things that we talked about Evercoach, dharma coaching institute his social media all of that in the show notes so make sure you check that if you want to learn more about what he's up to all right let's go ahead and jump into it here is ajit nawalka Okay, so Ajit, we're going to talk about self-coaching today. And to kick things off, I'm curious if you can share that how your experience with Mind Valley, becoming co-founder of Mind Valley, and I'm sure that was a journey all, all in and of itself. We could probably have a whole episode on, but how did that experience and being its former CEO shift you into this um, paying attention to the need for self-coaching? So it started with. So I, I have had a season in life, I'm sure all of us have had, or most of us have had seasons in life, and we have had the chance to reflect on them. Um, and I had a season in my life where I was just quitting being CEO of Mind Valley, And the reasons were because I was having a personal transformation time in my life where mm -hmm. I'd recognized that I was really happy and fulfilled uh, with my career, but not fulfilled with my life. So I was an overachiever because I was running a company like Mind Valley. We were doing like 40 some million in revenue at the time. And uh, and I was running that company and I was 31. So I was overachieving for my age. Wow. I, wasn't, I wasn't a special Howard graduate or a Yale graduate or anything like that. Uh, I was just an average kid who really had, I think, good value system and the ability to learn really fast is why, and I was at the right place at the right time, maybe, who knows, but but basically I got success very, very early on in my life, faster than I had ever anticipated for myself. And so I was, I was yes, wildly successful from the world outside terms or from the terms of how we evaluate success, but internally, like my relationship with my then, then partner, we were not really getting along well. I had no friends. I was not really very healthy. I wasn't taking care of myself. I didn't even know how to take care of myself. I wasn't feeling connected to to myself and to to my highest self and to one universal mm -hmm. mind. And because of all those reasons, I was like, this feels like I am on the wrong path. Because while, yes, I'm really grateful for such a fantastic career that I don't have to worry about money and such, I am not happy. And I wouldn't be happy if five years from now I was still doing this thing where I had all the money, all the success, all the bells and whistles that would tell the world that I'm a successful human being, but I wouldn't be happy and satisfied. Also, it felt a little bit wrong that you're running the most uh, impactful personal development company in the world and you were kind of unhappy <laughs> fundamentally as a person. So it just was incongruence and everything. And I was like, I, I don't think I should be doing this. I should take a step back. I should step away and I should do something about this, living a more fulfilled, living a more complete life for myself. And so I took a step back. I, I told my business partner, Vishen, that I, I'm going to step away as from running the company. He took over the job again. And then came a season where I went on an exploration of self, exploration of really figuring out what do I desire? What do I want? What makes me happy? What makes me feel fulfilled? And in that journey, I started engaging with a lot of coaches. A lot of coaches would come into my life when I was working on relationships. I would work with relationship coaches. When I was thinking about how can I be a better leader, I was working with leadership coaches. So and and so in different areas of life, I was hiring different coaches. I was getting great results, and I realized that a lot of the times while I was working with a coach, and this happened maybe four or five years of coaching, mm -hmm. but I was being coached, and also I started coaching people, and I realized the biggest transformation a coach actually causes is not on the coaching session. That's where the insight happens. But the transformation actually happens between the coaching sessions. Yeah. Right? It's not if you are from context of health and well-being. It's not when you're working with your trainer in the gym is when the transformation is happening. It's the diet or you not falling for the crazy, you know, snack time 
is what really transforms your health, your habit of building the ability to eat and choose the right foods. It's to do the workout when the trainer is not watching, right? To change those behaviors were happening between coaching sessions, right? And what I found is those are the moments, those moments when we are very weak, those are the moments when we want to go for that emotional support, for that emotional bag of chips or whatever that is for you. That's when transformation happens. But a coach cannot be present at all times, right? right? A coach is not omnipresent. They're not going to know. They us- You would usually call the coach when you've already hit rock bottom, not when you're going to the rock bottom. And that really invited me to, to consider that we should, as coaches, build competencies with our clients where they can coach themselves mm-hmm. when moments like these happen or generally. See, mm-hmm. one of the things that I think coaching thinks about differently than, say, therapy is that we don't try to keep our clients forever. Right. We don't try to go, hey, how can I get this guy yeah. to pay me for the next 10 years? That's right. not, it's a very um, old school medical, old school therapy approach. This is not a, I'm not trying to shit on therapists, but that <laughs> tends to be the business model, right? Mm-hmm. That that once the client is through the door, let's keep this client forever and ever, ever, right? You must come to the therapy session every week at a set time or every other week at a set time. And I feel there is there's something in that journey, in that revenue model, we've forgotten the whole point of doing what we do, right? We do this because we want to want the other person to have a great human experience. And I think coaching doesn't really have that model yet. We don't want to tie a client to us. We are not trying to say, hey, if you're working with me, you'll work with me for five years. You could because you're getting even exponentially better results, but you're not using me as a crutch, mm-hmm. right? And that's where I built a model of self-coaching where I said, if you could coach yourself during the times I am not present with you, I have enabled you, I've not become your crutch. And that's what the whole model and philosophy around self-coaching is. Mm, Thank you for sharing that. There's so much goodness in your story. The first thing I'll highlight is I love your entrepreneurial journey specifically and uniquely because you hear so often in the entrepreneurial world and the self-development part of the entrepreneurial world, like there's kind of this like bagging on people who are, you know, in a job that they hate and they're lost in it. And but what you're saying is like, I mean, you you really made it. I mean, you really you were like, I'm 31 and I'm the CEO of Mind Valley. So what's interesting to me about this is be is that I saw a post that you had made about embodying, right? Like that w- as human beings, we're very good at like learning something and thinking about it and technically quote unquote knowing it, but not actually being it, not actually, you know. And I think that you probably have a very high ability or high level of that, right? So I think that you were able to learn really quickly and take action, go learn really quickly to, and which brought you there. And then you had the awareness, the self-awareness to say, oh, I, I innocently, even though I thought, wow, I'm like, really, I'm, I'm sure during the time you were like feeling really fulfilled and like excited and like, wow, this is so awesome. Like all my dreams are coming true. But you had this moment this like self-awareness, honesty, truth moment. And those are the moments right there. And I know, you know, because you work with people, it's like, it's like eating humble pie. It just, it kind of sucks. Like you just, it's very uncomfortable. And it's like, no, I have everything put together. I'm doing everything awesome. In that moment where you're like, no, I'm not. That is such a huge moment. And I love your story because it's so like, mm, the the quintessential like i made it but mm, abandoning ourselves on a lot of levels in the pursuit of business which is so common right and then mm-hmm. you took this and so i'm curious about this phase of your journey in which you had all these coaches and you're willing to look inside yourself and mm-hmm. you're talking about essentially integration which i i couldn't agree with you more it's like we want people to have the skills away from us to be able to like, what do you do when it's, you know, for me in health, what do you do when it's Friday night? And all you want to do is just not care about any of this anymore. What happens inside of you? And like, what's a process you could take yourself through? And really a lot of that is me asking them what they think would work Mm -hmm. for them. I have Mm -hmm. my ideas. I have thought stuff that's worked for other people, but let's hear, you know, but I'm Mm -hmm. curious, like when you were in this phase of eating humble pie, (laughs) Mm -hmm. of like, you know, feeling like maybe there's some pieces of my life that aren't, um, I'm curious, like before you even got into the coaching part of like hiring all these coaches and really, 
like what kind of shifts happened inside of you? You know, like what was that little break like for you? Because I know you work with a lot of entrepreneurs and I think this part of your journey is really significant. You know, Mm -hmm. like what can you describe that little phase of the, I'm going to look at some stuff I've been missing here. Any Absolutely. wisdom to share? First of all, so so wise of you to, to recognize that it's about getting your clients to really share what yeah. is it that they need to do when it's Friday night and they need to, yeah. you know, they, they are going to fall for that trap, <laughs> quote unquote, right? Right. Uh, whatever that is, it could be a glass of wine, it could be a bottle, it could be friends who are going out and they're going right. to binge on some desserts or somebody's birthday party, whatever it might be. So, so, so such a great coaching ability there. Uh, I just want to recognize that as, as you shared it, because it's not everybody is able to do that. Everybody gets very much into the phase of, let me tell you what you should do <laughs> versus let me hear what you could do, right? right. It's, it's a, it's a, it, it's sign of a great coach to be able to listen and sort of, sort of talk. Now, yeah. bringing back to the, bringing back to the, this phase of life where I was going through. So, so how I got to the point of, of really, recognizing that I wasn't truly happy doing what I was doing. I wasn't satisfied. Well, I wasn't fulfilled was because I was, it was 31st of, 31st of December. It was New Year's time. I used to live in Kuala Lumpur. That's where Mind Valley used to be headquartered. Now it's global. But at the time it was headquartered in Kuala Lumpur and all of us used to live there. I moved from India there. So I had no family there per se. Mm-hmm. And my then partner had decided that she was Italian, that she's going to, go to Italy and hang out with her family. And I was like, I ain't going in that cold <laughs> because she's from Northern <laughs> Italy. It gets really cold. I was like, I don't know why that is fun. Uh, I get the snow and the Christmas, but that's pretty much it. That's where my joy ends. And so I don't want to do this long holiday in Italy. So, so anyway, she goes away. Um, I am left with only a few people that I kind of work with because I have no real friends. All my friendships are mm-hmm. work friendships people who are from outside the country, because that was also a bunch of my friends, they all left back to their own countries for holiday season, similar reasons. And so I was left with some people from the office. And so New Year's Eve, I was I was just a regular person like everybody else, right? So I'm like, all right, New Year's Eve, what do you do? You go out and you 12 o'clock in Kuala Lumpur, they would do fireworks, kind of like New York or Dubai. Uh, where they would do fireworks and all that type of fun stuff. So we would be like, all right, let's go on the street and we're going to you know, watch the fireworks. And as we are on the street, we're walking down the street, we're, cl- we're, we're close to these twin towers that are in Kuala Lumpur, waiting for the fireworks to happen. I realized that I am alone. Like literally everybody else had somewhere walked away or something. And it was just by myself. And mm-hmm. it was about to be 12 o'clock, right? Mm-hmm. And as I was, I was just looking for people and I was about to take my phone, I see this beautiful person, beautiful woman across me, beautiful Asian looking woman, uh, slightly older across me, dressed completely in white mm. as if she was going to a ceremony or some kind of, or was coming from a ceremony or something like that, right? Unlikely for middle of Kuala Lumpur on a New Year's Eve. Okay. Unlikely, completely does not belong there in that attire, you know, that kind of a thing. And I was like, okay, kind of, get, kind of gets my attention because it's so unique and so different, right? And this person looks dead in my eyes and start, starts walking towards me. And the person walks towards me and stares in my eyes and says, who are you? Okay, and I was like, I, I don't know who this person is. Why are they asking me? I don't think I recall this person. What does this mean? Who are, who are you? I was like, but still, I was just like, all right, whatever. My name is Ajit. And you're like, no, but who are you? I was like, well, I, I'm the CEO of Mind Valley. It's a company that does personal transformation. She goes, no, I want to know who are you? Oh, wow. And I was like, shit <laughs> i sorry i don't know if i can use the word oh, no, but, you're fine, you're fine. Uh, but i was like i don't know how to answer that question <laughs> right and by the time i was thinking about this in my head so how will i respond to this question because i i didn't know what else to say this person just starts to walk away and fireworks start to happen so i get distracted and by the time i turn around this person's not there anymore and i'm left with this question who am i who am i And all night I'm walking like this is New Year's Eve. So, you know, you're like still in the heat of it and I'm walking and I'm thinking, I forgot about my friends at this point. So I'm just walking thinking, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? And this question keeps bothering me for several days post that. And and I can't get the answer. And as I find that I don't know who am I, I recognize that 
one of the things that I have to do, that I must do, is to end things that I hold so tight because that's how I define myself. Yeah. Right? My identity ha- was so tight to being CEO of Mind Valley mm-hmm. that I couldn't imagine anything beyond that. Mm. So in that question of who are you lies often the answer of how you perceive yourself, what's important to you, what's not important to you, mm-hmm. right? And as you discover that, you 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 figure out what's, what's the thing that needs to change. And that led me to then quit Mind Valley, recognize that my relationship was not a, a relationship of convenience. It wasn't a relationship that was actually helpful to me, it was growth oriented, where I was excited about. My friendships that I'd lost were actually really dear to me. So I rekindled those friendships. Mm-hmm. I reestablished my relationship, an honest relationship with my parents instead of a superficial one. So it, it really led me down this road, which led me down the pathway of selecting different coaches at different stages of my life. Not all of them came at the same time because I could not really resort everything at the same time. Uh, And I also think our manifestations, whatever we are creating in life, have a a time and place for it to be realized. Mm -hmm. It doesn't realize all at the same time just because we are doing the work. Something needs to come together for something else to happen. Just a correlated story. So I had my, I have two kids. I, my son's about five now and my daughter's about two and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, my son's actually almost five and a half now and my daughter's two and a half. So when my son was born, I started to get a little bit into health and well-being, but I never really stuck to it. But then when my daughter was born, an incident happened that completely transformed how I valued health and mm-hmm. well-being in my life. Mm-hmm. And while I'm a crazy manifester and I was living the best life. And at the same point, I'm, I, it wasn't that I was totally unhealthy as a person, but I was definitely overweight. I was definitely tired as a person and definitely didn't have the level of energy that a, uh, that a 37, 38 year old should have, 39 year old should have, and so, so 37 year old should have. And what had happened was when my daughter was born about a month after, so around 30th of June, my son and I decided we'll go out and play. Just because, you know, the, my daughter and my wife are sleeping and we're like, let's go out. Let's go to the park. Now, you know, Austin. So, you know, it gets hot as hell in July and August. Oh, yeah. Right? So, it was one of those really hot days. Oh. But we were like, you know, I have a three-year-old. At the time, he was three years old. And at three years, they don't care. It's hot or it's cold. It's, to them, it's not really a season. They are happy being outside. Yeah. So, but I was like, okay, I'll take you out. It was like maybe four or five in the evening. So I was like, it's fine. It's not that hot. It was hotter before. And and so we go out and we start playing and we start running and, and we are running with each other. And uh, and after a couple of minutes, I'm offing and puffing. I'm going, mm-hmm. my son goes, da, 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 come on, come on, let's go play. Let's go play. And I'm like, oh, hold on, hold on, buddy. We just ran. We're like, no, but da, da, let's go, let's go run. I was like, look, hey, listen, I'm I'm tired. And he looks dead in my eyes and he says, you're always tired. Wow. Right. And then he, he, he might have said that to me before. He might have said that to me after that. <laughs> but in that moment, mm-hmm. I recognized that he's right. Mm-hmm. I was always tired. Mm-hmm. After work, I would go home and I would pretty much lie down on the couch. Mm-hmm. That they would maybe play around me, but I wasn't really in movement, in presence with them. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, you realize you could be a coach, but there are areas of your life that you haven't really invested time, energy, effort into coaching into. And so you are stuck in your old self and your old identity mm-hmm. for a very long time until there's a wake-up call. Yeah. And that you always tired was a wake-up call. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. was a note from the universe to say, you got to wake up. I, I tell that is because sometimes we think, oh, watch it. So that means when you quit CEO, six months from then, you were like, everything was perfect. No. <laughs> I've been on that journey for eight years now, and I think I'll be on this journey all my life because there's always a different version of me that I find as I go through life. And one of the key skills that have helped me is is being able to coach myself, to be able to recognize such moments when they happen and be Mm -hmm. able to make that story and capture that story to create something in my life that's truly joyous for me. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing those stories. And, um, I think I love that both of those stories, sometimes I find, don't you find in the personal growth world or the health world is this way too. Like 
sometimes I run into energies where people want someone else in their life to change, right? Like I want my husband to get healthy or I want my parents to do this diet or I want, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just like lead by example and love them because until something like that happens for them, where it clicks internally for them that they want to change, it's all it's doing is damaging the relationship because you're wanting to control them and they're feeling judged by you. And like, so I just love, those are both such the woman on New Year's Eve and your son playing outside. Like those are the moments that like they will happen for that person if and when they are meant to. And until then, like, just love, just love, <laughs> lead. If you, if you want to influence them, just influence them without trying to influence them. Just go be happy. <laughs> be happy and do do what you got to do. And, mm -hmm. and note that our need for them to change mm -hmm. is, is the work we have to do. Mm -hmm. Right. We can tell ourselves that it is love, but it is not. No, no. It's what are it you trying much... to alleviate in yourself yeah. by changing yeah. them or wanting What's them the to What's the blame change? you're trying to put on them? Uh -huh. <laughs> because you are not willing to take it for yourself. How are you trying to create an experience of, I will show you, you will accept me, and I will do that mm -hmm. by by shaming you, by putting <laughs> you down, by telling you what to do. It's, right. I know it will, it's, it's triggering for a lot of people because they go, oh no, that's not what I'm doing. I, I love, love my husband. I yeah, want I love my kid. Him. Right. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not always true. It's that's why it's curiosity. Be, be mindful of why you mm -hmm. need them to do something. It's usually fear alleviation. I find, you know, like yeah. what's your fear under that? All right. Well, you hit on something so great too. And since you are fully the expert on self-coaching and this is what you've been mm -hmm. doing with thousands of people. So you said like you have those moments where you're like, okay, something's got to change. I have those moments a lot too. Like I just had one yesterday, a big one. It's like something's coming in, something's coming in. It's like, mm, how do I feel about this? Okay, make the hard decision. Okay, let's go. Let's shift this, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people struggle with that a little bit, right? Like they might mm -hmm. feel that come in a little of like, it's like they just push it away push it away. And people like you and me, like we like, we, we sit with it. We, we taste it. We roll it around in our mouths and we feel it all. And then we're like, okay, let's go. Let's change. You know, I'm curious since you're doing this every day with people, like, what is it that you think that causes some people to not do that? And for some people to do that, some people to not self-coach and for some people to self-coach. So is that I'll go in two tangents. Okay. And, and and there's a reason for that because there's enough evidence in both of the sides qualitatively that I have. Okay. So the first tangent or the first category of people are people. So I very rarely met people that will not take action. The okay. problem is consistency of action. The mm -hmm. problem is not okay. the action itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And what I find with such individuals is their understanding or expectation of action to result is so uninformed that they give up on action much faster than they need to. So I just did an event. It's about three months ago. We had a beautiful event here in November where we did a three-day immersive on identity. And one of the students stands up and says, Ajit, you tell us if you believe a story and you tell your story long enough, you would have a new identity. If you have a mindset that you remind yourself to long enough, you will believe it and you will create that as your new identity. I've been telling myself, and I've been trying to break my financial mindset for a long time. Mm -hmm. And why am I not rich yet? So I said, all right, it's great. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see what's happening here. How mm -hmm. long have you, and so I had given some principles. Principles were like, give before you ask, don't even expect an outcome. You know, principles of money that I believe are true for it to manifest in your life, right? And so she was like, I've been doing this, I've been doing this and it's not working for me. I was like, all right, how long have you been doing it? She was like, I started doing this about two months ago. I'm like, okay. So two months ago, you started, this was about, this lady was about 50 plus, right? Okay. So like two months ago, you started to change your mindset, right? And you see that you haven't become a millionaire yet. How long were you operating from the old mindset? And she was like, well, about five decades. <laughs> I was like, so you want 
yourself to be reprogrammed of a programming that you've carried for 50 years in two months, <laughs> right? So there's a bias because we think, oh, it's a magic pill. It's not a magic pill. It's like trying to say, hey, I went to the gym for 60 days straight. I've eaten garbage and I'm 200 pounds overweight for 60 years. And then 60 days, I should, I should change my body. It's not going to happen, no. right? Have a realistic expectation of transformation. So understand that when you start to change, it's not going to immediately happen. So mm -hmm. it's not that you start self-coaching today and tomorrow you have the most amazing life. No, it'll right. start. It'll start. Change starts and takes time to really get into your body, your soul, and your real operating in alignment of your new belief and your new identity. It's not a one day effect. It's not a one day journey. It will take at least 90 days. That's a minimum to set a new reasonable, reasonably aligned identity. So what, what I mean by that is if you, let's say, if you want to believe that you're a healthy person and you have been unhealthy all your life, it's going to take at least 90 days for you to establish one behavior. And this is qualitative data. It changes based on person. It changes based on what you're trying to change. But for example, if you're somebody who's never hit the gym, which was me, by the way, two and a half years ago, you would ask me three years ago, two and a half years ago, you would go, I just how many times you've gone to the gym. I've gone in some seasons, maybe for one or two weeks, and then I never went to the gym. Now mm -hmm. you can't get me out of the gym. Like if it, my day feels incomplete, if I don't go to the gym, at least for a walk, if not the gym, right? I literally, we had this podcast a little later in the day, which is why I couldn't go to the gym. So I went for an hour walk before I could come here. I didn't want to sweat myself so much that I wouldn't be present for your, uh, uh, for this podcast. So that's why, well, I went for a walk. But activity is so important to me that I feel my day is incomplete. But two and a half years ago, you would not see it at a gym or for a hike ever. <laughs> like it was one of those things that I would never do. But it took me maybe six months before it became such a part of me that I can't give it up now. Yeah. Right. You're maybe even a, a year before that happens. Yeah. 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 Sorry. It's just you're creating a new normal. It's yeah. like every time you walk, you're going to start with your left foot. That's your goal. It's like mm -hmm. you're going to forget. You're going <laughs> to. It's just the same kind of thing. Because these are all yeah. subconscious patterns of like, oh, I instead of going to the gym, I'm going to put this call with somebody in front of it today. And tomorrow I'm going to put the laundry in front of it. And so next, you know, those are all yeah. subconscious. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, so the first thing is that people have unreasonable expectations yeah. Yeah. for the outcomes that they're going to have. So it's not that they're not self-coaching. They give up on self-coaching much faster than they need to. The mm -hmm. second thing to understand is self-coaching or results that are created through self-coaching often are not linear. It is yeah. not that you get the result one foot after another. It's not, it's not a linear path. It's a very, right. you have to stay present to the path to really see, oh, where we are going. So what happens a lot of times with us as human beings is because we are so uh, wired to look at the immediate, mm -hmm. we never reflect on the long term. And because mm -hmm. of that, what would happen is, let's say immediately tomorrow you have a bad day, you go, oh, you know, it's not working. Like the technique that I learned doesn't work, right? <laughs> or you had great six months and then you have a bad month in business and you start to think business is not good for me, right? <laughs> or I can't make this work. It's too anxious. It's too uncertain or whatever the thing is, uh -huh. right? But the key to understanding self-coaching is that it's done in cycles of seven years. Mm. If you think everything in cycle of five years, seven years, you will find self-coaching is one of the most powerful tools you can have because coaching, you still need coaches along the way, by the way, because there is a lot of reflection that can only happen in partnership. It's very difficult to do it internally just by yourself. Mm -hmm. It's easier to do it in conversation. It's easier to do it while you're discussing the idea with someone. You can find your blind spots much more easily when you're working with a coach versus totally. trying to do it yourself. So absolutely, you need coaches in parallel but you also want to stay present to the duration of the overall journey that you have. And you yes. should try to commit from my perspective, qualitatively, anywhere between three to seven years before you give up on anything, be it a new business, be it your body, be it a health routine, be a diet, be it whatever, give yourself enough time, except for if you're obviously seeing it's not working. Right. And, and that, that, that does happen. Sometimes people change yeah. too fast. Yeah. They just go, Oh, I have, like people like you and I, we can give up and quit things faster, which also sometimes is to our detriment, mm -hmm. right? We, we would go, oh, you know what? It's not working or this doesn't feel right, but we haven't given the chance yet enough because mm -hmm. often 
there is a path that is being created. And for that, you have to go through the ones so you can experience the tens. Mm-hmm. There's an idea, one of my friends, Colin O'Brady, he is the first person to ever cross all of Antarctica unassisted uh, by mm-hmm. himself, all alone. Oh, yeah, wow. uh, Carrying his like 300 pound sledge on his back, right? And he has a wonderful book called Impossible First. That's the name of the book. And in his book, he talks about how uh, there are ones and there are tens. Ones are the shitty events, the the events that not not sorry in the twelve hour walk. That's the name of the book. Sorry, I was giving you another okay. book that he wrote. Twelve hour okay. walk. In the book, he talks about ones and tens. Ones is the poor, the bad experiences that you have, and without those, you cannot experience the tens. The tens are the great highs that you have. So while you're coaching yourself, while you're going through the journey, we often quit when we're experiencing ones. Right. But ones right. is what makes tens special. So you must go through ones to experience the tens. Mm, I love that. And I love that um, encouragement to reflect back after seven years. So anybody who's been on a growth journey in any way, shape or form, look back seven years. And like, I think um, one of the things that we miss often in our pursuit of, I don't even know if I like the word growth anymore, (laughs) self-understanding, self actualization, maybe just, you know, just really finding out like what's possible for you in your life and healing your stuff and going for it. And then learning, you don't want to go for it that way. And like all this whole journey, if you've been on one of those and you look back seven years, I think that we forget often to like really have that like heart loving moment, like almost bring you to tears. Like, good job, dude. Look, like, Mm, that was really hard and that was really beautiful and like wow like look at the reality you're living in now good for you like we don't do that enough you know I don't think I, I I'm I'm a pretty big pusher on it with my clients every single week is like what's what's going on that's good right because it's so easy mm-hmm. on this slippery slope of like gotta fix this and gotta fix that and gotta da, da, and gotta do better and be better and, blah, and it's just so unkind and um un we're it's it's dishonoring of us you know so i love that that encouragement to really like reflect back and see like how has this been going last and you're like actually that's been going pretty good and actually my little mindset about this aspect of life i have not really evolved there in seven Mm -hmm. years so maybe i might want to take a look at that one you know yeah (laughs) so yeah i love that yeah and and such a great point because what also happens with that is every time we keep beating ourselves, we don't realize, but we're actually losing trust with ourselves. Yeah. And when we keep right. losing trust with ourselves, we lose confidence. We lose faith yeah. in life. You yeah. know, it's often said as people get older, they become bitter. Mm. It's not because if age makes them bitter, age is not making them bitter. Their conversation with themselves, their conversation with people around them is bitter. And after a point, they start losing hope on it. Yeah. They start losing hope for the world. They start losing yeah. hope for society, people around them, with around their kids, with around their parents, whatever it might be. People are not becoming more bitter because they because age is making them bitter. Age is not mm-hmm. experiences. Mm-hmm. And that's why you would also find wildly optimistic people who are slightly older right? Or are older in age because they had a different conversation. They were not beating down themselves. They were not being pessimistic. They were not talking about how they have not made progress. They were talking about how much have they learned and grown and gotten better. And they were celebrating the past three, five, seven years of growth, of journey of the ones and the tens. And because of that, they became more affirmative, more positive, and ten- then they tend to be more successful. This is actually by data, qualitative and quantitative, that people who are more positive tend to be more successful. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. just tend to be. And the reason is because they are having a positive experience of life. And so they're expecting for the positivity. So their curve is always up. Mm-hmm. They can't even see the down. Down they see as, oh, it just happened. It's just a day. It's not a down. It's just a journey, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. that's that's very interesting for us to note is, is to always remind ourselves, hey, how if I take a frame of three years, yes, I may have had challenges, but the season that was right after the challenge that's where you grew, right? Oh, yeah. So maybe that challenge was for a reason. Maybe there was a purpose to this. Maybe there was a reason why that thing happened mm-hmm. so you could grow, so you could oh, discover yeah. that new version of you and the new power of yours, um, new new journey of yours, right? So, so that's, I think, that that that's a very interesting way to look at life and consider yourself as, as a affirmative, 
direction that you're going towards so you can change your state and stay in the presence of awesome you are, not mm -hmm. how things didn't work out at some point. I'm noticing themes throughout your shares of catalysts for growth. Like, and it's speaking to my, my trainer hat that I wear sometimes, right? Cause you talked about how having a coach is really like a catalyst for your own work in between. And you're talking about how these <clears throat> low moments are catalysts for growth. And I, I think it's so on point. I really do. It's like, when we think of growing muscle, right? Nobody expects to go to the gym one time and like walk out with literally visible. I mean, maybe some people do. And those are that first group you talked <laughs> about, but like you don't expect to go in there obese and lift some weights and walk out. And you're just like this muscle person, you know, that doesn't, no one thinks that, but <clears throat> sometimes like, I think we forget, um, in our personal growth journey, how much recovery times so we, we need stimulus recovery, like integration is like that recovery and then stimulus and then cruise and then stimulus and cruise, you know, and like same with the lows, same with the, those lows are like stimulus and there you go. Okay, mm. cool. I might not have to hit a low for an, a little, hopefully we don't have to hit one for a little while or maybe hopefully we will, <laughs> however you want to look at it. But I love mm -hmm. that I see you hitting on that of like really mm, encouraging these little stimuli, these little catalysts for growth. And then it's like, and what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that stimulus? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Ever coach Dharma coaching Institute. Uh, <laughs> I heard you say that you have events. Um, can you explain to people a little bit more about what you do and what you offer? <laughs> so, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so my primary, so once I quit being CEO, the first thing that I did is I started coaching companies and people because while I was getting coached all the time, it was just my curiosity. I was like, I want to learn how to do this. So I picked up skills from different places. I was also a really good leader when I was doing business myself. So I took the hat of business coach consultant. And then from there, fell in love with life coaching because that's nice. most of the time what I was doing when I was talking to businesses was coaching people yeah. in there. And so I ended up building a great methodology around life and business coaching. Alongside that journey, because of my own curiosity, I found that a lot of coaches tend to be not successful in their own way, from their own light. I'm not saying they need to be millionaires, but they were not eating the financial income they wanted. They were not serving the amount of clients they wanted to do and so forth. And that encouraged me to say, let's solve this problem because these people are awesome. These people are great. They're doing the kind of work that I want to do for humanity. And, uh, and so I was like, I want to support these people. And I recognize the reason why coaches were, and still sometimes are not successful is nothing to do with their capability, but their consistent growth in themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think it's because of business tactic. It's not. Business tactics are easy. The business doing business is actually incredibly simple. Uh, it only gets difficult for people that are not working on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was like, okay, so the, the gap that I'm seeing is that a coach gets certified and they think now all they need is tactics. And what they're not recognizing is your certification does not mean you actually can create results. You have to consistently work on yourself and educate yourself and keep growing for you to be able to drive results. And without results, you can't sell a product. If you want to sell a product, you better get results. Mm -hmm. That's why a client will stay with you or a client will refer you. And all these things will only happen if you're good at what you do, mm -hmm. right? So, so that brought my attention and we started doing Evercoach or built Evercoach as a platform, which was for continuous coach education. This is for people who already were coaches, certified or not, doesn't matter, but people who, who, who said we are coaches and I want to learn more were bought into that idea. We started doing Evercoach for that. We brought in Mind Valley as partners in the company. So because Vish and I are friends and we've always been, you know, I've helped them build a company and so on and so forth. So we brought them in as, as business partners for Evercoach as a company when we started it. And then we were just building Evercoach and I was doing coaching for a hot minute until I recognized it was during the kind of time of COVID that even when everybody else was struggling in that season with business or otherwise, the companies I was working with and people that I was working with were thriving, mm -hmm. not just financially, overall, like people were having, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm cooped up. And my, my tribe was super happy. Like they were, they were like, it doesn't matter. They fi figured out how to do remote work. They were having a great time. They were engaged with their kids. So I was like, hey, I have something here that works, even in the worst of situations when people are not able to figure out what to do. These techniques, these tools work. So, so I made them into a certification called Certified Business Coach mm -hmm. and Certified Life Coach. And during that journey, 
uh, Mind Valley also got really, really interested and wanted to kind of quote unquote merge us in yes. in the company and make it a part of the company. So now we are called Evercoach, but we are also Mind Valley Coach. It's the same company okay. that delivers to both the businesses, oh. uh, but it's it's a it's a it's our certifications and it has, it's our online programs that help people become better coaches. Nice. Now, during this experience, my wife has a friend. Her name is Sahara Rose, and she came out with a book called Discover Your Dharma. Now, in Mind Valley, we tend to work on ideas that we can scientifically give a justification for, like we can prove it. Like anything that we teach inside is either psychologically, philosophically, or scientifically, I can draw a line and say, hey, no, this is why this works. Here's studies on it, right? So it's very scientific, you can say in a way. But I also know that and I'm sure you have had experiences in your life and your audience has as well, where you can't scientifically explain them or psychologically explain. They mm-hmm. just feel odd. They feel they were metaphysical. They were mm-hmm. spiritual almost in nature. It was almost like guidance from somewhere. Mm-hmm. You may call it God. You may call it Allah. You may call it whatever you want, a universe. You may call it whatever, but it's unexplainable. Yeah, at least for now, right? Yeah, so for such kind of education, my wife has this, her friend is Sahara and, and now we are friends as well. And she said, Ajit, this is something that you guys don't do. And I think there is space for this. And we would love to see if we would want to partner and create another company. And that led to Dharma Coaching Institute, which mostly, not mostly, it focuses on more, uh, let's just say, for lack of a better term, esoteric. I don't know if esoteric is the right term for this, uh, but basically ideas that are worth exploring, but I may not be able to justify it using science. I may not be able to explain it using science, but you can experience it, nice. right? So a lot of embodiment work, a lot of uh, spiritual work is done on that platform. So that's mm-hmm. that's what Dharma Coaching Institute is. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are three of my companies. One is me coaching companies. I only do very few clients now because of my work in other fields, Evercoach slash Mindly Coach, which is the place where I invest most of my time in. Mm-hmm. And then Dharma Coaching Institute, which I am more of an advisor for. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there are other companies that I've invested in. We have a we have a technical company. We have an e-commerce company that's coming out with the first queue of oh, products wow. in the coming two, three months. Oh, uh, wow. So I, I like to do different kinds of businesses, but they need to have a purpose and a meaning. Like it should yeah. be inspiring for me to what I do. Uh, and then then I like to do them. Mm, beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that. And then in terms of the few people that you do, Coach, is this on your Coach Ajit? dot com website is that what usually i don't put it there uh because again it's very invite only kind of a thing you i can only be referred into and then also i have to see if i want to do it if i have space to do it and all that type of fun stuff am i excited about that company Mm -hmm. or that person Mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. even the most exciting people right now are not it's just i don't i don't i i also have a two i have two wonderful kids i have a wife i love hanging out i love travel yeah. Um, I love hanging out with my friends. I go on long vacations. Like I just came mm-hmm. back. Like I said, the reason why we are talking later than the dates that we were supposed to talk is because I was away for like eight weeks. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I live a very full life and I don't Good. want to Good. do things just for money. I, right. I don't do things just for money. I mean, right. money is definitely a great byproduct and I love it, mm-hmm. but that's not the reason why I do it. Are you still doing events? Or I is do it just- do events. I do do events. We do we do events under the umbrella of Evercoach or Mind Valley Coach. Evercoach. Okay. Yeah. Most okay, cool. all of my products go under Mind Valley Coach. Okay. Cool. We will link all that up. All right. Let's close this off with tools. Can you give throw out a few of your favorite self coaching tools? Meaning, okay. For example, a tool that one of my wonderful coaches has given me is based a lot in the work of Byron Katie. Byron Katie talks about the three businesses, and she has her own. Uh, twist on that. She's really close with Byron Katie and kind of developed mm-hmm. her coaching system back in the day and moved some things, but she calls them realms of power. So she asks, is this my realm of power? This is Catherine Dixon of Clarity Coaching, by the way, but mm-hmm. is it my realm of power, their realm of power, or like God or the universe's realm of power? And anytime you try to control something outside of your realm of power, mm-hmm. you're going to suffer because you can't. And the past mm-hmm. is outside of your realm of power. The future's outside of your realm of power. Mm-hmm. It's just you now you know and that's like a tool for mm-hmm. me you know it's a tool mm-hmm. that i use it's like yes like i'm oh i'm getting all up in their realm no wonder i'm all mm-hmm. i don't get they can do whatever they want to do oh yay mm-hmm. peace and freedom again you know mm-hmm. so do you have any uh, i mean i don't mean like give away all your secrets but just wondering if you have any nuggets <laughs> of tools 
that kind of come to mind that you could leave people with, even just one? Yeah, sure. There is there is few. It and we can like it depends on what we're talking about, right? So I'll give you one life tool and one uh, maybe one business tool. Thanks. Let's start with the business tool to to kind of get a different way of looking at things than what we have on this conversation as of now. So a lot of us uh, who are in business often would be, I have a hundred ideas and all of them feel like they should be the ideas I should pursue because that will help me grow my business, right? Mm -hmm. All Like most of us who does a business have always seen, but how do I choose which idea to work on, right? How do I really know what is the right idea for me? So I have a framework for it to decide. And this works in life as well, if you want to prioritize, but mm -hmm. it's a little bit more... Um, too pragmatic an approach. And so sometimes it doesn't work for life priorities, but it would definitely work for work priorities. And that is to rate all of the different ideas and things that you could potentially do across four factors. First factor is leverage. Leverage is what leverage do you have for it to work, whatever the it is. Second mm -hmm. is ease or E. So it's L-E-R-R. -R. That's those are the that's the acronym that we're gonna unfold. Ease ease. Easy is how easy it is on a scale of one to five or zero to five. One to five probably is better. One to five, how easy it is. On the scale of one to five, how leveraged it is. If you have high leverage, you will rate it a higher thing. If it's mm -hmm. easier, you will rate it higher. You'll give it Love a five, it. right? Then the third factor is risk, how risky it is. Nice. So more risky it is, the lower number you, uh, sorry, the okay. less risky it is, the less number you'll give it, right? Sorry, less risky it is, the higher number you'll give it because you want low risk, right? Right, okay. So if it's low risk, you're going to give it a five. If it's a high risk, you're going to give it a one. Okay. Right, so it's the only thing that is inverse. So you have to be mindful mm -hmm. about that. Low risk mm -hmm. is a higher number, right? Mm -hmm. And then is return. What's the likelihood of return that I have on this project, right? And then what you would do is you will take all your ideas and start reading them one to five across all these four dimensions. And on once you total up, each one of these, right? So idea one may have a total of 17. Idea two might have a total of 12. Idea three may have a total of 19. I you will that. take away everything that is under 15 because they right. are usually complete garbage. You shouldn't do that. If everything is <laughs> under 15, it. start over. All your ideas are shit. Do something else, <laughs> right? So I under 15 should never be the case, yeah? So yeah. you're looking for over 15 ideas. And once you've got over 15, let's say a couple of ideas, then let your heart tell you which one to pursue first. One is a very simple thing. If it's the highest, if some, something is 20, just do it. You're going to make so much more revenue on it. So much with so little risk and anxiety and fear that you should absolutely go for it. So that can get knocked out of the ballpark straight away. It gives you more confidence in your business. Now do the 17s and the 18s and the 15s. If you have mm -hmm. to do like 15, even 15, I would not really do, mm -hmm. except for if I'm really out of ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's all of them are fitting into that. <laughs> Otherwise I would just go to a blank slate, try to find more ideas that were more likely to win. So that's a simple tool anybody can use if you're I confused about what to do first, yeah. do L-E-R-R. Smart. Yeah, I can see you have a, a brain that is it, it's excellent for coaching because you're, you're able to take that probably comes very naturally to you, right? Like I'm thinking the last thing that I just pushed in my business is like pro, a 20, I think like I'm like, this was smart. Yeah. This was a smart yeah. move. And but I, I but to be able to identify it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like break down for others. That's what coaching, you know, that's a coaching thing. Yeah. And that's, I love the simplicity and ease of you taking all this, like how you make decisions basically and yeah. putting it in a simple formula. That's awesome. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. And Thank you have you. a life one you said. Yep. So okay. if you want to develop a habit, which all of us are trying to build a habit, right? Remember mm -hmm. the terms, term hits, H I T S hits, right? Habits are equal to I, which is identity, T, that is trigger, and S, that is skills. Mm. If you want to build a habit, you need to work on your identity, trigger, and skills. If you don't have a new identity that you re you're leaning on, you will not build a habit. If you think, oh, I'm the same person, you're not going to build the habit. If no. you're trying to build a health habit or become a healthy person or live a healthy life, you need to assume and start to lean into the identity of a healthy person. There are many ways to do so. You right. can start visioning yourself as an athlete. You can put right. a vision that's three years out that really gives you the identity of who you need to be today, mm -hmm. right? There's a whole work you can do, but you mm -hmm. need to first have an identity that you can hold on to and say, this is who I'm becoming or mm -hmm. who I'm being right now deciding this am. moment, especially right. with the whole thing that you talked about, Byron Kitty, the 
outside yeah. now, whatever the thing was, but basically one power. of the points you yeah. said, now is the only moment that you have, which by the way right. is a fundamental of what I coach on as well, is the mm-hmm. only moment you have at any time is now, right? right? So so identity is the first thing. Is you need to understand that it's not only becoming, it's by being that person right now. Mm-hmm. The second thing to remember is it's triggers. If you don't trigger that identity, the identity you're trying to get into, you are going to forget about it. Nice. Even if your heart says in that moment, this is what I really, really want. You will forget about it after day four, day five. The reason why we say February is the month when everybody quits their new year resolutions is because they don't set good triggers. If you set a good trigger, you will always go into your identity. There's a reason why I, I gave a passing example. Usually I would not be in my office at this hour. There's about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the evening, right? Usually 2.30 in the afternoon, I go straight to my gym. Mm. Around 3 o'clock, I start my workout. Around 4 o'clock, I go home. At 4 o'clock, 4.30 onwards, I'm with my kids all the way till late in the night. I'm admittedly feeling some guilt that you, you missed your gym time for this. <laughs> my team scheduled it. Usually I'm like, why is it at 4.30? Like, like me of all no people? Way. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's all good. It's all good. But I'm just saying... <laughs> that it's such a trigger because it's on my calendar. There's right. no way. Like it's literally saying right. kind of love your body. It says right. love your body, which effectively nice. means go to the gym or do something that's for your body. Nice. Right. So that's the trigger. You need to establish trigger. And the third thing that you need to remember is skills. If you don't recognize that everything that you do is a function of skills, which effectively means you need to develop it, mm. you're going to go up on the habit. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. so if you want to you know why people sometimes go on habits is they go to the gym and they don't know what to do right yeah but it's just working out is a skill you right. have to learn oh that's how you work with this machine this is the posture this is where you will hurt right. your body this is what you have to be mindful of no it's not about your back it's about your butt you know whatever the thing is right so right. you need to learn those skills for you to be able to actually build that habit because otherwise mm-hmm. you'll get frustrated Mm. right? And when you get frustrated, you give up on the habit. Same is for writing. Let's say you want to become a writer. Are you like, hey, listen, I want to write books. Mm. I want to write every day. The first day you got to approach it as, what do I know about writing? Because you will get frustrated if you don't understand it's a skill that you're building. Mm. And so approach every habit as a set of skills that you're going to build. Mm. Uh, those, those are incredibly solid from the identity piece. That's my first question in my personal growth program too, is who are you? So it totally resonates yeah. with me. And then the triggers, whenever somebody says, I'm going to do this this week, I'm like, when? What's going to be mm-hmm. your, you know, yeah. mine, if I really want to make something happen, it's before the gym in the morning, because I know I'm going to go to that gym. I love going mm-hmm. to the gym. That's like my reward time. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's like, if I really want to make something happen, like when I was writing my book, it was like, that is, you can't go. So you write for an hour. Now I've got that trigger like you're talking about. And then, yeah, skills, obviously, you're going to have to eat humble pie yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, get, and learn and apply yourself. That is so solid. I love how you're able to take such mm, a lot of deep thinking, a lot of observation, a lot of, you know, seeing people do this and yourself and like put it into something so simple. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with us. It's Thank you. Excellent. Um, all righty. Well, we'll link up everything. We'll link up all everything we talked about in the show notes. And thank you so much for taking the time. And I hope you, you so much, Sarah. a little exercise if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I did my walk, so I'm good for the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. <laughs>